Could Mikhail Gulia be the best defenseman in this draft class? Uh, Tony Ferrari, our old bald king, joins in the last draft profile of the season. Say, on Locked on Sharks. Your Locked on Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to Locked on Sharks, the premier hockey podcast covering your favorite team in the Bay Area. My name is J.D. Young, contributor at San Jose Hockey Now. I want to thank you for making Locked on Sharks your first listen, probably a part of the Locked on Network, where we cover your team every day. And If you want to be an everydayer, all you got to do, follow along wherever you get podcasts, or you can watch this on YouTube as well. And we have made it uh, the 29th. And final draft profile, um, Tony Ferrari joins to talk about Mikhail Gulyev, and who is a very boomer bust defenseman. But if he hits, oh boy, if he hits. So um, we're going to talk uh, about that. And then uh, Tony talks about kind of, I let, he lets me pick his brain about some of his final rankings. Um, so before we get into it with our good friend, Tony, do want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you guys by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. And now we bring in our bald king, Tony Ferrari. We started with the first profile of the season. We're ending with you with the first profile of the season. Buddy, we're almost there. How's it going? Not too bad. Busy as always, but it's a good time of year to be me. Yes, it is because you know uh, you have like a week worth of work and then you get to go right into off season mode while the rest of us are still cranking out that content every day, Tony. Uh, but yep. someone who we know is constantly cranking out the production and the defense uh, is one Mikhail Gulyev. So if you don't know Mikhail Gulyev is a defenseman over in uh, Russia and this year, he played mostly for Omsky in the MHL. Five foot 10, 170 pounds. Uh, in 33 games, he had two goals, 23 assists, 61 shots on goal. He also did play uh, in the VHL and in the KHL a little bit. So I ask you, as I ask everybody, what makes Mikhail Gulyov such an intriguing prospect? Do you like offensive defensemen? Because you, if you do, you know my all- motto. Defense yeah. is for nerds. Go score points. <laughs> exactly. And that's what Mikhail Gulia is going to bring to you. He's, he's every year I, I, I kind of deem one guy all gas, no breaks mm-hmm. uh, as a defender. And that's Mikhail Gulia this year. He's a guy that his defensive game is going to be questioned no matter what level he's at, whether it's the MHL, VHL, or the KHL, which he's played at all three this year a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, this kid's offensive game, the game his, his ability in transition is really what really makes him special. I think. He's such a fun player to watch. I don't know if he has the true high end upside to be uh, a legitimate difference making number one guy, but I, I see him as a, a bit of a Morgan Riley type player where he can kind of be a one a one B maybe if, if he reaches his full ceiling mm-hmm. in worst case, he's a really good offensive guy in your second pair. I, I think there's a lot of upside with this guy. He is a little bit small. The five ten is always going to kind of get teams to be a little bit shying away from a player, that, uh, uh, especially on the back end. But the skating, the, the transition ability, the offensive creation that this kid has, it, it really makes you go, maybe we take him in the middle of first round. So, I mean, we know the Sharks seem to covet guys who can skate on the blue line, right? And if Mikhail Gulyev, I know he's a little bit smaller, but I mean, that seems to be a trade that they're looking for. Like, how great is his skating? His skating is really good. He's one of the better skating defenders in the entire draft class. I think he's an absolute beast when he has the puck on his stick. He's able to break out of the off defensive zones with ease so, 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 so often. Uh, there there are some times where he can kind of panic a little bit when he's getting bared down on by by big hulking uh, wingers and on the forecheck, especially when he's at the KHL level. But at the VHL level, he was able to break out seamlessly. At the MHL level, he was able to break out seamlessly using both his passing and his skating ability. And I think that's what's really valuable about him is he's not a one-trick pony on the breakout. And I think that's mm-hmm. where a lot of guys run into trouble at the NHL level. They found success doing one thing so often at the junior levels and at levels overseas. 
that they kind of default to that oftentimes. And, and that's not what Mikhail Guliev does. He's able to make that big bomb pass. He's able to fl- flip the pass up the ice and over defender's head and get a, hit a, a, a flying winger, on, a streaking winger into the offensive zone. And if he doesn't have that, he's able to kind of take space himself, use his feet and use his puck skill to get the puck out of the o- defensive zone and into the offensive zone. Then once he's there, He's able to kind of skate around. He's got really good four-way mobility. I want him to go a little bit more laterally on the offensive blue line. He has the ability to do it, but he doesn't do it all the time. And Mm -hmm. I think that'd be the one question. But, man, this kid's got so much passing ability, so much skating ability that you can see what he can already do. If you can refine some things, coach him up a little bit, there's a lot more to unlock. So, I mean, other than the skating, how's his shot? I mean, you know, he only had two goals. I don't know if maybe he's the biggest goal scorer, but uh, maybe he's more of a let me just get to the net type of guy and let somebody else kind of take care of it. What do you, what do you kind of how do you grade out his shot there? I think his shot's fine. I think for a defender, if you're looking mm-hmm. at the, the shot is always one of the last things I look at. Having a big shot's a bonus. I think that's always a nice thing to have. But he's more of the snapshot on on net and hope for a rebound and kind of get that. This guy's a lot more focused on getting the puck to the fours and getting the puck into the slot, passing the puck that way. I think he's going to need to develop the shot. I mentioned Morgan Riley early, and I think the big reason for that is it took Riley a while to develop that shot in the NHL level. He was always a guy that would just try to either – rip a big clapper and he telegraphs it so easily by doing that and it wasn't until the last few years where he started to develop a bit more of a wrist shot from the blue line just getting the puck through and creating havoc and i think that's where mikhail guliev can excel this isn't a guy that's gonna have a big bomb clapper at the back end if you want that go with a david reinbacher or something but a more efficient shot i find from the back end in modern nhl is that quick snap, that quick wrister from the blue line that be, that gets through the screens? I think so oftentimes guys are blasting the shot from the point and it hits the guys in the shin pads. It hits Brett the guy Burns in the butt. special, baby. yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> like you just burst in dudes' shin pads open, and it's like that looks cool, I guess, when it goes yeah. in, but so oftentimes it gets blocked and it becomes a, a play going the other way. So I think using his shot effectively is going to be more important as he develops, but. This isn't a guy that's going to do that too often. He's more of the passer, more of the playmaker from that back end. And then he has the ability to kind of creep in when he gets a chance to as well. All right. Other than his size, which we know, uh, you know, there's nothing he can do about that. And of course, putting on more uh, muscle because every 17 year, 18 year old kid needs to put on more muscle as they go to the, you know, continue their pro. What do you think um, is the thing he's going to need to work on the most for his development? Um, and I assume it's just learn how to play defense, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, just taking an interest in the defensive side of the game <laughs> might be a, a just good idea. Just going into the defensive zone. <laughs> yeah, being a, being a defenseman that plays defense. It's a wild <laughs> concept, I know. But uh, no, it's uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're joking a little bit here, but this defensive game is going to need some work. I think there are moments where you see him use his skating to cut off passes and cut off uh, mm-hmm. uh, attacking forwards and, and push them to the outside, use that. But he's going to need to get stronger. He's going to need to get more willing to engage. And I think that's going to be something that he needs to work on. But at the end of the day, I think this is a guy that you're more looking at as a, as a power play puck mover. You pair him with a really good defensive defenseman and let them do a lot of the work on that back end. We're seeing so many more NHL teams move to that one offensive to one defensive pairing guy. And you see that offensive guy become more of that rover. You see him become more of that fourth forward in a lot of plays and while I think you certainly need to be able to play defense, I think his tracking ability is going to be able to play up. His skating ability is going to be able to play up. And I think coaching is going to be the big thing. In the, in the MHL especially, they're not really taught defense. If you don't have the natural instincts, you're not going to do a whole lot there. So it, it's going to be about an NHL team getting him in the rankings and going, okay, this is what we want you to do in the defensive end. We don't need you to blow anyone up. We just need you to cut off some passes, cut off some skating lanes, and, and really d- limit guys and push get them to the, the outside. Way. And I think yeah. th- exactly, get in the way. I think, and, and that's certainly possible for Guliev to work on. All right, guys, before we continue with Tony Ferrari talking about Mikhail Guliev, kind of where he fits in, um, you know, why, why he's such a, you know, so intriguing why he's such a boomer bus prospect um do need to take a quick break uh and talk to you guys about our friends over at game time and we know it's summertime we want to go out enjoy things maybe you're going to some concerts you want to go see the giants go see the a's whatever you want to do you need to get some tickets game time is the way to go they're fast and easy way to buy tickets in all the sports music comedy and theater near you um, killer deals on last minute tickets and they have the best price guarantee so you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting excited about the fun that you're going to have um 
Love, I used it. Got some tickets for my wife for uh, Ed Sharon Sheer- uh, um, for her birthday. Um, went on there, looked at the seats. I was like, ah, these seats are good. And I, you know, spent a little bit more, but I got way better seats because I was able to see what the seats are going to look like. And great thing about it is if I keep an eye on it, if the prices, if I find the prices for the tickets, the same section and row for less, game time will credit me 110% of the difference. Um, they send directly to my phone. I have to go scrolling through my email. They made it super easy to, to go. And we are super excited to go see her. She's very excited to go see him in this September. So snag the tickets without the stress of game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL. Get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, so what do you think is going to be his calling card as he gets into, you know, uh, as he comes over to North America, play, I assume he'll play in the AHL, play in the NHL. What do you think will be his kind of calling card uh, trait? I think it's going to be the transition game. I think a lot of people have deemed this guy this really good offensive defenseman, but mm-hmm. I think it's really going to be the, the his game through the middle of the ice. There's so much that in today's NHL that the game is going from off defensive zone to offensive zone, and it's such an underrated uh, metric. I think we're just starting to kind of break through with Corey Schneider's tracking data and some of the other tracking data we see on Twitter and on uh, different websites. So I think that's going to be where this guy really, really excels. I think his offensive game is going to be very good. He's a very good playmaker passer. Uh, I think his game on the breakout is very good. But through the middle of the ice, I think that's where you're going to find ass or find value with uh, Mikhail Guliev because he's able to skate the puck. He's able to pass the puck. And you don't have a lot of guys that are able to do both. So it's going to be really interesting to see where his point totals end up. But I think a lot of times you're going to end up looking at his season and go, I feel like he should have probably 10 more points, 15 more points than what he has. But at the end of the day, he's got really good passing metrics. He's got really good transition metrics. We'll ignore some of the defensive flaws because he does produce offensively as well. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of see where he settles in. All right. Uh, So then, you know, we mentioned the point totals and stuff like that. And probably going to be a second line pairing. What do you think his peak season looks like? Is he probably like a 45, 50 point player on on a good team type of, of guy? Maybe not. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I guess Riley, like, yeah, 45, 50 points feel about right for him, maybe. Yeah, I think somewhere around that, if he hits his peak, I think that's where you're going to see him settle in anywhere between five and 10 goals, probably, because, like I said, he's not a big shooter. Uh, yeah. Five and 10 goals, 35 to 40 assists. You settle in around there and, and be that guy that's a, a good second pairing guy that can play on the power play. If you're a team that doesn't have a clear cut power play guy like a Colorado who, who has Kale McCarr or, or San Jose who currently has uh, Eric Carlson, then maybe you, you, he, he gets relegated a little bit to that second power yeah. play unit and to- totals come down a bit more. But if you don't have that guy, he can kind of step up and be that guy on the power play. So I think that's where you're going to find some value with him. Where the point totals settle in, like I said, that's going to be a question mark of exactly where his role ends up being. Um, so we know, you know, the Sharks acquired Shakir Mukamadulin um, in the Timo Meyer trade. Mook Madolin, bit of a head scratch, I think, for a lot of people when he was picked. But like you, you definitely do see see some of the flashes in his last, you know, after coming over to the Barracuda, you really kind of saw some of the point production after he got settled in there. Um, how would you, you know, both I know Mook Madolin's like seven foot ten. Um, how would you <laughs> kind of compare their games between the two? Again, Mook Madolin, not really known for his defensive style, but uh, what do you just on the spot here, how would you kind of compare the two? I, I think it's interesting because I think Mook Madulin wants to do a lot of the things Mikhail Guliev can do. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where you get the, the questions with Mook Madulin. I think he has the the raw tools to do a lot, but he doesn't quite have the the IQ or the understanding to be able to actually execute it. Whereas I think uh, Mikhail Guliev has the understanding, has the IQ to be able to kind of pick up a defense apart and make some of the passes that uh, Mook Madulin wants to make. I think Mook Madulin is going to end up settling in as more of that defensive guy if he gets to the NHL and ends up having a good long career because he has the size, he has the the strength and the skating. He's going to be able to kind of drive some defensive met- metrics. I look at him, and I know a lot of people are going to be kind of giggle at this a little bit, but I look at him more of as a Martin Marincin where he, he drives some good metrics. He doesn't really ever produce offensively the way you think he might be should have or, or had the potential yep. to do. But he's able to play a half decent defensive game, prevent zone entries, and do a lot there. And maybe that's a guy you could pair with a guy like Mikhail Guliev, who is able to do a lot of the things that that you'd like to see from a puck moving defenseman. And in change, because so many defensive players are focused on Guliev, maybe that opens up Mukhamadulin a little bit more down the road if they are paired together and kind of 
get him to be able to make passes with a little bit less pressure on him. If they do pair them together, I just want like a twins cover where like <laughs> they're both like back to back and Gulyev's like up to Mukhamadolin's hip. And that's about it. That's that. I think that's what we need as Sharks fans. But um, so he's going to be over in Russia for probably a, a couple of years at least. What do you kind of see the timeline for Gulyev before he's making an impact in the NHL? So it's going to be a few years. I think, I think he's got the contract that runs through 24, 25. Um, he probably needs at least a year in the AHL a season. So you're looking at 26, 27 realistically. And I know that seems like a far kind of reach for a guy like this, (laughs) but it's not a rush for the, for the sharks right now. Right. And that's why I look at some of the draft picks that they have. And I go, they can take a risk on a guy that, maybe has to wait a little bit and maybe hinting at a different rush in here that I'm talking about with a higher pick, but you can wait on a guy. You don't have to rush him. There's no reason to be like, Oh, we need this guy in the lineup tomorrow. Take the guy that you can wait on, take the guy with the upside and let him develop, let him kind of come into his own as a, as a player. And and that's where you can really kind of win the draft a little bit, maybe. So, I mean, we're going to talk more about your rankings here a little bit, but you have Gulyev, pretty high up there compared to some of the other uh other defensemen so i think Gulyev's number 13 on your on your personal rankings um ahead of a guy like david reinbacher who is projected to be the first defenseman in the draft so uh why one do you hate david reinbacher and especially compared <laughs> to Gulyev's game <laughs> I think the big thing with David Reinbacher is too many people are chasing the more insider archetype. And we've gotten into the habit of doing that over the last few years. With the Who's the next Braden point? Who's the next more insider? Who's the next player X? Yep. And, and, and that's such a bad thing to fall into. And I think with David Reinbacher, he's playing in an obscure pro league over in not necessarily obscure, but like a, a lesser pro league over in Europe that he's producing a half decently amount. And mm. He's doing a lot of things and he's, physical he's big he's got the tools but then you watch David, yeah yeah, right and you watch the watch this game and you watch him play and he's chasing hits he's getting beat a lot he's trying to impose himself physically but he doesn't have the strength to do it quite yet he's a good skater but not a great skater i think i look at his game and i go he's maybe closer to a poor man's david juracek than a more outsider and i think that's the big concern with with david reinbacher's game is I don't see the offensive upside. So much of his production came on the power play. So much of his production came from doing what I said earlier with just that big bomb of a shot where he telegraphs the shot by raising his stick to the rafters and just firing the puck on net. Rebound goes in or someone chips yep. in a shot and, and some goofy defender puts the puck in his own net, which I've seen this year in a Reinbacher game. And you're like, okay, well, like that. He literally that's... just picked it up and put it in the net. It was really weird. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, that doesn't happen, right? Like yeah. those aren't projectable things. Yes, he's got the tools. He's got a big mm. shot. I think he's a good skater. I, I think he's a physical player, willing and combatant. Do I think it's all going to translate perfectly? No, I think he's got a, a few flaws in his game that are going to need to be worked on. And then with Mikhail Guliev, I think that for me, it's the upside play. I think the separation between the two probably is a little bit big, even on my board. Yep. But I, I look at a guy like Mikhail Guliev, and I think, man, if I can get Morgan Riley out of that, I'm pretty happy with that. If I can get a guy that's a, a Sam Gerrard, I'm pretty happy with that. With David Reinbacher, I go, am I going to get Martin Marincin? Am I going to get Shakir Mukhamadoulin? Am I going to get a guy that ends up being a, a solid third pair defender? great but i don't know if i'm gonna get that that top four guy and if you do i think you're gonna end up force feeding them those minutes and and going this is who we drafted you to be rather than this is who you actually are makes a lot of sense all right, guys, before we finish up with tony uh we talk about uh his rankings and some guys that he is you know have maybe a little higher than he's a little higher on than everyone else. Maybe some guys that he's a little lower on than kind of the consensus do need to take a quick break. Talk to you guys about our friends over at bird dogs. And if you're looking to upgrade your shorts game, bird dogs is the way to go. They have stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg and give you a truly sculpted look. Um, I wear them. They're my go-to shorts on the weekend. Um, again, I got soccer, you know, soccer uh, on Saturday morning. We're usually going to Target. We got to go to Costco. I'm cooking out on the grill. I'm maybe we're at the brewery. Whatever I'm doing, bird dogs, you know, they just fit 
and make me look good while I'm doing it. Um, they have anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Um, the built-in underwear, you don't have to worry about things kind of uh, snagging or getting chafy. Um, so go check out bird dogs. Um, they have plenty of different styles, plenty of different, they have the inseam. So, you know, a little bit longer inseams. If you're like me, if you want to show off the thighs a little bit more, they got you covered there. So go to birddogs.com slash lockdown NHL, get a free Yeti tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash lockdown NHL for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take off your bird dogs. We promise you. Uh, before we get you out of here for the season, I guess, uh, let's talk more about your rankings. Um, so going through your rankings, you know, pretty normal. Um, I, I do enjoy you having Alexander Sandin Pelic as your number one defenseman. Um, just I enjoy that a lot as a ASP. Uh, let's let's go ride with him. Um, but looking at some of your guys, like you have Mikhail Gould, you have number 13. Another guy that's really stood out uh, is Quentin Musty, who you have at number 11. Um, what makes you love Quentin Musty so much? Now, I, I need to preface this with I know you're having Brock on to, to talk about Quentin Musty. And Brock and I have debated all year on the THN on the O podcast for that we cover do the, for the hockey news where we cover the OHL, we've debated Quentin Musty quite a bit this year. And I think for me, at least there's a lot of issues that are a little bit overblown with Quentin Musty. I think there's a lot of people that go, well, his, his efforts not there. And if you watch his playoff tape, that's just not true. If you watch his tape later in the year, it's, it's not e exactly as prevalent as it was early in the year mm -hmm. well, early in the year. He was dealing with mono. Like this is a kid that was playing for the first three months of the season, not at hundred percent whatsoever physically. And it yep. showed, and when I talked to him earlier this year, he said he wasn't really even feeling himself until after the new year. And you started to see him right around then, just before Christmas, starting to pick up his game. And then in the second half of the year, especially after the the, the calendar change to 2023, he was the top scoring OHLer in the, in, in the class. Even going back to guys like Colby Barlow, who absolutely tore it up at the start of the season, was slowed down as the year went on and eventually ended up getting hurt and, and not reaching that 50 point mark or 50 goal mark. I, I think with Quinton Musty, you're getting speed, you're getting skill, you're getting size. He's played about a lot more of a power game this year where he's willing to engage physically in terms of being a puck carrier that protects and allows a, guy, a defender to sit on his hip and, and try to get the puck from him, but he's just not physically able to. And he's able to use his strength in that regard. I think he does a lot of things where he puts his shoulder down and, and makes a difference that way. This isn't a physical player, a power forward that's going to go and blow anyone up. He does it from time to time, but that's not necessarily his game. He's a power forward who's going to put a defender on his back and drive to the net with the puck on his stick. He's a guy that's developed an exceptional playmaking talent this year, especially, and he still has a really, really good shot. And I think his shot wasn't used as much this year as it sh probably should have been, and that's mm -hmm. why the goal totals were muted. But even still, he found a way to be right up there at the top of the scoring race for the OHL draft eligible lead. So I think with Quinton Musty, you saw him do so much, especially in the second half of the season after kind of recovering from mononucleosis, that you go, what would he have looked like if he was healthy for the full season? What would he have done if he wasn't dealing with the strength, the lack of strength issues from that from that illness? I, I think there's a lot to like about Quinton Musty's game, and I think you're just scratching the surface with his game, and I think that's why I have him so high up on my board. I, I think Colby Barlow is a perfectly good player, and I think that's the player that a lot of people expect to see at the top of an OHL draft list. But for me, Quinton Musty is the guy because he brings a lot of the things Colby Barlow brings, and he's got so much more of a well-rounded game, I think, in my opinion. Defense is an issue for both guys, but I think you can work on that with a guy like Quinton Musty, especially on the wing. All right. Um, one guy who, as you said, is one of the most divisive prospects, and uh, Andrew Cristal. You put him at 18. Is that you hedging or what, like – is is crystal gonna be one of those guys where a couple years from now we're like wow how did he go so late or is he one of those guys like man what what could have been for him if everything worked out honestly it is me hedging a little bit i think <laughs> Love it. he's a guy that's been so confusing this year because the offensive skill is absolutely outstanding the, the ability to produce in, in his shot there's so much to like about his game I think you watch his game and you go, man, that's a lot like Mitch Marner. That's a lot like Kirill Kaprizov. There are some of the shiftiest guys in the NHL, and he he, he brings a lot of that to the game. The issue is, imagine if that those guys couldn't skate. And, and I think that's what you're getting with a guy like Andrew Cristal. And it's like, 
yeah, a lot of that's awesome, but man, like you got to skate at the NHL level. And I think it's something that's going to need to be worked on as he works up to the next few levels, but this is a really high end offensive player. If someone takes him, I had him in the top 10 for a lot of my year. He kind of dropped down towards the end of the year as I started to notice that if he's not having someone get the puck to him in the offensive zone, he has issues. And I think that's a concern for me. But with that said, what he's able to do in the offensive zone is truly, truly special. One of the top five or six offensive minds in the draft in that regard. So I think if someone does take him to the top 10, I'm going to give him a handshake and go kudos to you, man. Like that's a, it's a risky move, but it's a, could be a really smart move. If this guy falls to the second round. You're probably laughing and going, Hey, this is just like when Logan Stankoven fell a couple years ago. And now look at how good that guy is. Yeah. He, uh, Logan Stankoven, good at hockey. All right. Um, yeah. Congratulations. You're now uh, GM Mike Greer. Assuming Will Smith is a pick at number four, who are you targeting for the Sharks at 26 as they continue their rebuild? I, I think Quinton Musty, Alex Ascendi, and Palikas are both are good options there. The guy I'll go with is number 14 on my board, and he's been a lot lower on other boards, if you, even in the second round, which I think is criminal at this point in the year. It's Otto Stenberg. He was the captain of the U18 team. He's been a captain for that Swedish national team a bunch of times at different levels. This is a guy that plays with such pace, such intensity, such just offensive fortitude, and he doesn't give a crap about your feelings at all. He's going <laughs> to go in there, and he's going to absolutely tear your defense apart, and he's not going to apologize for it. He's going to go in there. He's going to forecheck. He's going to make life absolute hell on your defense defenders be- below the goal line. He, he's not the biggest guy, but he plays a lot bigger than he is. He outscored William or he tied William Nylander's scoring record at the U18 tournament. Uh, it's 16 points in seven games. Mm-hmm. This is a guy that I, I think there's so much more to be unlocked. I think the big step for him was when he played at the pro level this year, you started to see him actually play with some of those pro tendencies. I think when he was at the junior level, especially early in the year and last year, he was just a wild man that was just clearly better than so many other players. <laughs> yeah. And he just treated it like that this year. When he went to the SHL, he was like, I have to accept the fact that I'm a third or fourth liner on this team. And I have to do the work and put in the time and, and earn my offensive opportunities. And he did that a lot this year. So I think this kid's so well round, so much more well-rounded than people are giving him credit for. He's a top 15 guy on my list. And I think he could fall right to that sharks pick in the late first round. And if he does, I think you could be developing a really, really nice Swedish pipeline that would uh, maybe anger some Red Wings fans who like to claim that they have the best Swedish pipeline in the NHL. Uh, I mean, yeah, that would be their third first round uh, Swede in a row. So uh, between Ekwin Bistead and, and Stenberg. So I think with Stenberg, the real key is just to like sew the Swedish national jersey underneath whatever jersey he's wearing. Because whenever he puts that on, he's like turns into Superman. It's pretty crazy. It's like... As soon as he puts on that yellow, it is, it's a different level for him. So, all right, Tony, we'll get you out of here. These last two questions. Uh, So question number one, I think I've asked you who you think the best non Connor Bedard player is. Um, I've asked you, I know I've asked you guy, your favorite first round, Um, which guy in the top that's projected to go in the top 10. Are you a little queasy about if you were a fan of that team, if they made that pick? Dalibor Dvorsky. I think that's the guy I've been concerned about all year. And that hurts my my heart because I came into the year being the guy that was really hyping him up. I I, I was the guy that jokingly named him last year, Dally Dope. I I was a guy that was pumping him because there were so many things I really liked about his game. And he's just not taken the step that I expect him to take. I think you saw it in the Svenskan and in the Swedish pros this year. Mm-hmm. He wasn't really able to take that step and be a, a play driver. I think he's going to be a very good complimentary player. I think if he's either going to be a third line center who plays a solid defensive game because his positioning is really solid back there. But I think the big thing that limits him is his actual puck transporting ability. He's a fine skater. He's not a, an explosive guy. He's not a guy that's super agile especially away from the puck he's a perfectly good skater when the puck's on his stick you notice him kind of shift down a gear or two and i think Hmm. that's a big concern for me i think that's the area of his game that i worry about there you you see some of his transition metrics from some guys that track him whether it be uh, a former friend of the world will scout who has kind of gone into his own little world or a guy like mitch brown yeah i I think you see some of the tracking metrics from him in, in, in the neutral zone and you go those look good and then you watch him and you go that doesn't match and yeah. I think a lot of it is really low pace deeks, low pace kind of shiftiness. He's able to kind of hold the puck really well. He's, he protects it fairly well. He just doesn't have the speed or the agility to kind of do it at the next level, in my opinion. I think 
you get him on the wing, I think he'd be a really solid top top six winger. I think he has the shot to do it. I think he has some sneaky good playmaking ability. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, if he does play center, he ends up being a really good third line center because I think his defensive positioning, especially on the first initial rush into the defensive zone, he's very smart there. He understands where to be, what to do. Uh, when it gets kind of sustained zone pressure, I think that's where he gets lost a little bit. But I think a lot of players, especially at this age, are, are yep. in that boat. So he's already ahead of the curve there. But I, I think he could be a really good third line center, a really solid second line scoring winger and an absolute havoc on the power play. I just have concerns about him being a true play driver. And I think a lot of people are kind of selling him as that right now. Especially if you're spending a top 10 pick and you're exactly getting, yeah, it's the value, uh, value cost opportunity. So, and then the final question, uh, where does Mikhail Gulyev go in the draft? What's your pick? I'm going to say he goes signi- a little, not significantly later than I'm, I have him ranked on my board, but I'm going to say he goes at 23. Uh, that would be to the New York Rangers. So Gulyev to the Rangers. Maybe. <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, when we have someone trades for the cool, yeah, it trades up to 23, and then Tony Ferrari's going to be a genius. So, um, Tony, thank you so much. Where can the people find you? Uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter at the Tony Ferrari. You can find all my work at thehockeynews.com, and be sure to check out all my game tape with Tony videos where I interview guys like Axel Sandy Palika, Quentin Musty. Uh, I've got a bunch more coming out. I've done Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli, Leo Carlson as well, all the top guys. So there's a lot of players, a lot of interviews where I break down game tape with them. It's a lot of fun to do. And then I I ask some goofy questions afterwards that get some of their personality out a little bit too. So uh, be sure to check all that out. Uh, Tony, as always, a pleasure. Uh, See you at the draft? Question mark? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll owe you. I owe you at least one beverage of your choice. So can't wait for the hot chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys, we made it. 29 draft profiles, um, another mid-round madness with Josh Tesler. Uh, we had a goalie show with Greg Ballack. Like, we did it, guys. We made it through the draft prep season. Um, thank you guys for continuing to, to support and follow. Thank you to everybody who's been on, right? I mean, I, I tweeted out the list a while last week, but um, just all those guys taking time out of their days and their busy schedules, especially as the draft got closer and closer to come on here and talk to me about it. Um, so huge thanks to, to everybody who's been on the show to help uh, profile or, or talk about the draft. So um, we're here. We're now, now it's, it's, it's go time. So um, let's see, let's see what the sharks do with, the, with these picks. So hopefully my job was to try to at least make you, better informed so that way when the sharks do pick someone you can at least be like okay i've heard of this dude or you know type of situation um so it was again a lot of work went into a lot of a lot of these guys again spending some of their their nights hanging out with me for some so feel sorry for those guys so um but again thank you guys for for all your support with the draft coverage um we'll be in nashville next week i can't believe it's here but yeah be in Nashville. I'm super excited. I cannot wait to go. Um, so yeah, make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts or watch on YouTube. I'm going to be doing, there, there's probably going to, I don't know how many episodes are going to come out next week. There's probably going to be a ton of episodes. I would, I would set the over under at like seven and a half and I would probably take the over for episodes next week because you're going to have, um, I'm going to be at the award show. You have the draft two round or two days of the draft. You have free agency on Saturday. So make sure you guys are following along. Um, also going to want to follow along Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at locked on sharks. Um, Instagram going to be posting a bunch of behind the scenes stuff uh, from Nashville. Um, so make sure you guys are following along there and you can follow me on Twitter at my fry hole. Again, thank you to everybody who has come on to talk draft stuff and we'll be back tomorrow to talk uh, Bob McKean's final rankings. So until then, bye friends.